Hi, everybody. It's Steve Gorin, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Sales Between Trust, Writing Audit Business Interest, Partnership Audit Rule Update. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of, run out of time, it will be answered later via email. A copy of today's slides as well as other reference materials are available in the resource widget, and the materials just my fourth quarter newsletter, the articles uh, in which are the basis for today's webinar. You can also find these materials on our website. We encourage you to download any resources or links you may find useful. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 general credit and in Missouri for 1.8 general credit. We award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. From time to time, you'll be required to click a pop-up screen to reflect your current your continued engagement. The certification icon located at the bottom of the screen will only tell you if you have met our criteria for awarding CLE. It does not include the certificate of attendance. Once we have verified your attendance, your certificate will be emailed to you later tomorrow. This webinar is being recorded and will be available within 24 hours. You can access it from our website, www.thompsoncoburn.com. All in attendance will also receive a link to the recording. Please do not hesitate to share it with other professionals who may find it useful. And of course, if certain parts stand out, then they can fast forward to recording to those parts. We value your opinion and appreciate your participation in this course. Okay, so the first half of the time, we're going to talk up. I'm going to talk about sales between trusts, and then I'll talk about writing off business interest and, and an update of the partnership audit rules. So sales between trusts. We have several different issues that get involved with those, including income tax issues, the gift tax statute limitations, the GST inclusion ratio, and the alternative of terminating the trust and then let the beneficiaries do their own estate planning. So for sales between trusts, let's, let's look at the income tax consequences. Um, so, uh, ideally, we want to avoid income tax, and the two we would typically do it are uh, using or, use, or both involve a grantor trust ideas. So, first, if the trust or grantor trust was the same deemed owner, then there's no tax unless the grantor trust status terminates before the notice repays sufficiently. So, for example, mom creates an irrevocable trust, and 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 she retains income tax grant or trust powers, but but doesn't have any powers that will cause it to be included in her estate. Uh, lo and behold, five or ten years pass, uh, notwithstanding the fact that she really loved what she what she set up. At the time she did it, she's now had second thoughts. Um, sometimes trust can be modified, and and other times there are the consequences of modifying trusts are too great. Uh, in this case, uh, in, we've determined that she really they really need just a whole new trust, uh, and so mom creates another irrevocable trust with terms that she likes, and she also retains grantor trust powers. So she is the deemed owner of the old trust and the deemed owner of the new trust. So when the old trust sells to the new trust, there's no income tax consequence. Now, what about if, we, if, if grantor trust powers turn off? Suppose, suppose mom dies. Now the old trust is its own taxable entity, 
and the new trust is its own taxable entity, and all of a sudden, poof, they went from not existing to having old trust holds a note um, that that the new trust owns it, owes it. Is this a deemed sale? I don't really know. I don't think there's really any authority that addresses that. There's some authority that talks about when the or some some ideas when when the grantor held a note and now it's the grantor's estate that holds the note. Um, there's really nothing conclusive on that either, but there's some clues. Uh, but between trust, we really just don't know, and, and we don't know, you know, the basis of the note, etc. Uh, but I think the only thing we can do is just try to be practical about it, and and the, and the analysis. If there is some kind of a deemed transaction, um, it's possible. <clears throat> that there might be a a deemed transfer from one to the other. I don't really know. Um, but if there is a deemed transfer from one to the other, uh, then we would we would look to see well the the old trust which was taxes the tax to mom is the is the um, holding the note and it may be deemed to have sold those assets to the new trust. Uh, and uh, and then the question is: Is there some kind of a, of a transfer ta- of, a, of an income tax consequence? If there is one, and and again, I'm not saying that I think there is a consequence. Um, I, I I I really I really don't know the answer to it, and, and you know, I would argue that there is no consequence at all. Um, but who knows what the IRS will come up with, uh, and and the idea is if there is some kind of income tax consequence, I would tend to think that it would fall within the bargain sale rules. And you can see in kind of a little font at the bottom of that bullet point, it references 3B1C Roman at 1, uh, little a. So that is in my, uh, my, my business structuring materials, you know, the 2,800 pages. Um, and um, those of you who – are not as familiar with it. Uh, the newsletter uh, has uh, two yellow buttons in it. One is one you can download a link to the most recent version, and then the other link, the other yellow button, you can download a comparison to the prior course version. So, uh, the ways you can access this one is just if you're in the article for my newsletter on sales between trusts, you can click on the link and, and try to open it from there. Or the other is you could have simply have already downloaded downloaded that. Now the link doesn't always. Uh, I don't think that the, the link in the article always works. Uh, we do our best, um, but there's only so much you can do with everybody having different technology uh, on the user end. Um, as and and so uh, if you don't. Uh, Click on it to go right there. What you can do is, if you if you copy that um, 3B1C Roman at one, if you if you just take that and then you execute in the PDF a, a Control F function for find, and and you and you just input that in there and do a find for it, uh, it'll take you in the table of contents that will show you about bargain sales. So that's how you access that. Okay, so again, the first thing we have the uh, the grantor's individual. She was a deemed owner, and we don't think there's any income tax consequences. But you do want to try to pay down the note as early as, you, as, as soon as you can, just in case there's some kind of consequences that might occur on her death. Again, I'm not saying I think that there are, but um, I don't, you know, I don't really know. Lack of authority in there. Okay, now the second bullet point, the seller is a non-grantor trust. So an example of this might be that mom created an irrevocable trust during her life and now she's dead. Or mom's estate plan 
created a trust upon her death, and, and that trust is funded. Now, ideally, we'll, we'll have everything going into perpetual trusts, and people will have allocated the GST exemption to the trust, and it will be outside the estate tax system forever and ever and ever. But we know that each person has only so much GST exemption to go around. And you may very well have a, um, a trust that's not perpetual. It may even have some terminating provisions that are undesirable. Um, or, or it's simply, again, mom didn't have enough GST exemption to go around, so she has a trust that ha- that what we call a non-exempt trust, it has an inclusion ratio of one, so the GST tax would, would apply. Um, we may have some kind of a power appointment in there so that when the when the child dies, that it's including their estate instead of having GST tax, that may or may not be a good idea to have one of those powers of appointment depending on uh, the the state that the that, that everything is in uh, and 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 the and the beneficiaries' um, characteristics. Um, but the bottom line is we may have a trust that is not protected from GST tax, and we'd like to get the assets into a trust that's created that's protected from GST tax. So, well, mom is dead, so you can't do anything about having her create another trust. So you could have um, some family member who's not a beneficiary um, or maybe a friend um, create a new trust, and, um, and that new trust is going to be um, relatively thinly funded, and we're going to go to the next slide and and talk about how this works. So on slide five, any non-beneficiary will fund the new trust by placing up to $5,000 in a non-interest bearing account and allocating GST exemption to the trust. Now, this really needs to be a gratuitous transfer. It's not any good if the beneficiary gives money to her friend and then the friend uses that money to fund that trust. No, that would be a step transaction. That would be bad. Um, so um, it depends on who the who the person is who's who's funding the trust. Um, so I, you know, I if it I may tend to do a smaller amount, like a thousand dollars, unless they really want to maximize what it is. Um, and the this this uh, so this doesn't have to be related to mom in any way whatsoever. But but this person funds a new trust. Um, by putting that money into a non bearing account. And by the way, I've also had one where I had one where uh, dad created a non-exempt trust and then later realized, gee, we ought to have this into perpetual GSC exempt trust. And so, so then dad himself later created a, um, a trust like this. So the person funds the trust and then gives the old trust the right to withdraw the initial gift. Uh, and how long does your withdrawal right need to be? You know, whatever you're, you're comfortable with with crummy notices. There have been cases of proving as little as 15. Some people like to do 45, 30 days, whatever. Whatever you feel comfortable with, there's no – there's no bright line rule on it. That's the only gift you make to the trust. And it's really important to make this be the only gift and to do a non-interest bearing account. And and the reason is that we want to, uh, to make the old trust be the deemed owner of the trust. And the way you do that is the right of withdrawal, which is 671A1, and then in the the slide after that, 
we're going to go over after you have a lapse of the right to withdraw. So the goal is to have the old trust be the deemed owner of the brand new trust. Another another feature to think about is is the fact um, that the uh, that the grant. Oh well, actually, I'm going to I'll go over that in just a moment. Okay, um, on slide six. So the six seventy eight a one is why you have the withdrawal right exercisable. That that makes it a grantor trust deemed owned by the beneficiary. And then 678A2 says that if you have, if the, if the person who had to withdraw a right has released or partially modified the withdrawal right, then, the, then they become the deemed owner in certain circumstance. Uh, now, that language, we don't really know what it means, but the IRS in numerous private letter rulings has said that the lapse of the withdrawal rights is equivalent to this partial release or modification. So, um, so anyway, so that's, that's the, you have to have that. So you have the lapse and then you have to have it so that the beneficiary who had the right to withdraw, which again is the old trust here, has some kind of a power that would have made it be the deemed owner under the grantor trust rules. And one thing that I would do is to say that the trustee of the new trust has absolute discretion to make a distribution to the old trust. And and so that would be a code section 677 power because that 677 says that if the grantor can get distributions, then it's the then the grantor is a deemed owner. So with 678A2, you, you do a substitution and you say if the beneficiary could receive distributions, then the beneficiary is a deemed owner. And, and the trustee has to be a person who is not a beneficiary of the new trust because then they would be an adverse party. It needs to be a non-adverse party. Okay. Um, what about a swap power? We tend to use a swap power to make a trust be a grantor trust. The, the issue is that even though the swap power says uh, reacquire, gives it the grantor can reacquire assets, n numerous private letter rulings have said that anybody can hold the swap power. And there's even a revenue procedure that says that they suggest, that this is in the case of charitable trust, that you want to make them grantor trust. If you want to make a charitable lead trust be a grantor trust, you can't give the grantor a swap power because that would be self-dealing and violate the, the charitable self-dealing rules. So what they say is you need to give somebody other than the grantor the swap power, and that will work. So if you make, if you give the, the old trust the swap power, for example, um, then we have a case where somebody other than the grantor has a swap power, and and that under that revenue procedure, the grantor would be the deemed owner because of that. Now there there are a couple of private letter rulings that say if you have the swap power, then that's okay. Um, but I think that those private letter rulings are wrong, and that the swap power does trigger grantor trust status as to the grantor. And code section 678B says that if the grantor is the deemed owner and the beneficiary is the deemed owner, 
Then the grantor's deemed ownership supersedes the beneficiary's deemed ownership. And that would be very bad because we want we want the old trust to be deemed to own the new trust. And if the grantor of the new trust is the deemed owner instead, then you're not going to have a transaction between um, two entities that are considered treated as one. You'd be having a, tr- a, a, a transaction between the old trust and the grantor of the new trust. So I do not use a swap power here. Okay, on to slide seven. So now we have this trust in it that has maybe 1,000, maybe 5,000, some other amount in it. And that trust is going to, that new trust is going to buy assets from the old trust. The only thing is, you know, we're talking about maybe having the old trust sell millions of dollars worth of assets to the new trust. And when the new trust is so thin, uh, the IRS can argue that there's really no economic reality to that loan. <clears throat> so typically people will have some kind of a guarantee put in place. Now, who's going to do the guarantee? Well, you could have an unrelated party uh, guarantee it, and 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 then what would be their motivation for it? It would be a guarantee fee. So let me give you an example of how such a guarantee might work. Suppose you were doing a $10 million sale. Uh, typically, we would recommend that you have about a $2 million guarantee. Now, if you had a guarantee fee, of say even as little as one percent. So if you took two million dollars and multiplied it by one percent, that would be twenty thousand dollars. So what you're saying is that a trust that has maybe one thousand, maybe five thousand, agrees to pay twenty thousand dollars in one year, and that's going to ha- that's going to give the trust substance. Well, those numbers don't really seem to mesh um, because the trust doesn't have the wherewithal you know, absent performance on this deal. And the whole point is the guarantee is guaranteeing performance on the deal. So so having a paying a guarantee fee is is something which I would avoid for a trust like this. Uh when it when all it has is, you know, not enough to even pay the guarantee fee. What I'd rather do is to have some kind of a of a, of, a, of another incentive for the guarantor, and the idea would be maybe to have a side by side trust. So the grantor creates the new trust, puts a thousand bucks in it, um, and then now if the grantor is a family member who wanted to give money to the beneficiary, then they can create that side by side trust. They can, you know, put another, put a million or two million or something like that into that trust. And then if that trust has identical terms to the trust as the buyer, uh, uh, a trust is a relationship between a trustee and beneficiaries. And a trustee has a duty to promote those benefit that those beneficiaries' interests. And if there's an identical trust arrangement, then um, then that that trustee should want to promote an identical trust arrangement, and and so because again it's a relationship between the trustee and beneficiaries, you want to promote beneficial the beneficial interests, and and the trustee would would have a desire to promote the beneficial interests of the same people in a different trust. So if you have this, these identical trusts, then there'd be, um, and, and, and I, the um, incentive to do that. Now, the other thing that could do, suppose it's just a friend and they just want to put up the thousand bucks and be done with it. Well, think about the example I had before. Suppose mom died, and and left 
a big trust, maybe a big non-exempt trust, maybe also a big GST exempt trust. Well, the big the big GST exempt trust would have similar terms to the new GST trust that the new person is creating. And so they may have similar, the, the same argument. You have the fiduciary uh, relationship between uh, this, this other trust that mom left, this GST exempt trust, and the new GST exempt trust. So, again, if they have similar beneficiaries, then the trustee would have an incentive to, to promote a similar beneficial interest. So those are who the guarantors who I prefer to have. Now, what about a formula clause? If I'm advising a client on selling assets to an irrevocable grantor trust, then I will tend to have a formula clause. And my favorite one, which is not the only one you can use, but my favorite one is a defined purchase price clause. I hereby sell you my business interest in this partnership or S Corp um, in exchange for a note, the face amount of which is, a fi- is the fair market value of that business interest as finally determined for gift tax purposes. And then the grantor will file a gift tax return, will disclose the sale, and run the gift tax statute of limitations. And uh, when I have that formula, I, I always put in there that the, grant, that the grantor is required to file a gift tax return. Because if we're going to say finally determined, we need to, we need to make sure there is going to be a final determination. So finally determined for gift tax purposes. So then the gift tax statute of limitations runs, and then we know we have a final a final determination of the purchase price, and you know that's going to normally be like you know three years after the deal. So and the note isn't going to be paid down within three years typically, uh, although I actually have had it happen, but but typically it's going to be a little bit longer than the three years. So. So, so you'll know, you'll know by the by the time that the that the gift tax return statute limitations passes, or if there's a gift tax audit, you know you you can then determine the the amount of the note. So we know that that's something that has a definite ending point in time. Uh, now, uh, and by the way, you can see there at the top formula clause that says Roman numeral three B three. You'll see my materials where I talk about various formula clauses, and and I have excerpts from all the major cases, excerpts of the course language talking about the formula clauses, so you can see what the course actually said. Okay, so we've got this finally determined for gift tax purposes. Normally, when you have a grantor selling to a to a trust, and the regulations say that you need to have a completed transfer when you're selling. All right, let's kind of go through now and think about on, on slide nine. Who is making the gift if the if the sale has some donative element? So if the IRS comes in and says, hey, the purchase price was X. The value was X plus a million dollars, and and I'm going to have a um, you know to, to to audit you. The IRS said I'm going to audit you. So so who has made that donator transfer? So a trust cannot make a gift in terms of who owes gift tax. And the trust may make a gratuitous transfer because the trust agreement authorizes it. Um, but 
Um, if you have a gratuitous transfer being made, then for gift tax purposes, it's the beneficiaries of the old trust who are deemed to have made the gift to the beneficiaries of the new trust. So now let's think about, well, what are the consequences of that transfer from the beneficiaries of the old trust to the new trust? Again, we're just trying to identify the donor and the donee for gift tax reporting purposes. So what are the consequences? So it could be a totally incomplete gift. The beneficiary of the old trust is a beneficiary of the new trust, and the beneficiary of the old trust has powers of appointment over the new trust. It could be a totally incomplete gift. It could be a partially incomplete gift. Maybe the beneficiary retained some powers but released others. Well, if you have something like that, um, then Code Section 2702 says you don't get to count your retained beneficial interest. So then your gift is the, the value of your entire beneficial interest in the old trust. So that's another possibility. Another one is maybe you've made a completed gift totally complete a gift, but because you're a beneficiary of the new trust and you have some interest in the new trust, Code Section 2036 would apply. So that's another option. And of course, a final option might be that the beneficiary of the old trust is not a beneficiary at all in the new trust, and therefore it's a completed gift without any state inclusion. So you could have all of those scenarios. To run uh, the gift tax statute of limitation, each beneficiary will need to make a completed transfer and to report it using adequate disclosure. So our goal would be to have at least some part of the transfer be complete. So when you think about trust design, if you do want to try to run the gift tax statute of limitations, um, then you need to think about whether the beneficiary's interest in the new trust would, would cause it to be a totally incomplete gift or not. Um, okay. On to slide 12. So it's tough to get gift tax finality. You'd have to have all the beneficiaries File gift tax returns, all the beneficiaries have at least some kind of a completed gift. Well, if we can't get gift tax finality, can we get GST finality? Well, GST tax depends on not having an estate or gift tax event. Uh, and, and we don't even know about, you know, gift tax finality if, if you know, in some cases. So, you know, when, when can we get GST finality? Uh, but the bottom line is that the GST statute of limitations runs a later of running the statute of limitations on the transferor's estate tax return, so whoever the transferor is, or on a GST return reporting the transfer to a, oops, that's a slip person, it's just a skip person. Um, okay, so if the trust has more than one transferor, the portions of the trust attributable to the different transferors are treated as separate trusts for GST purposes. So if we have multiple transferors, then each, then the, then the, then the uh, you know, the, the recipient trust, for example, the, the, the new trust that's the buyer, uh, may actually be multiple trusts for GST purposes. And, and then if you're going to run the statute of limitations it's, for GST, it, you have to do it for each of the of these deemed separate trusts. And who is the transfer depends on who is the skip person. So, if you have, you know, Dad created the the old trust, 
for the benefit of child. Uh, well, maybe it's just for the benefit of descendant. And then the new trust is for the benefit of descendant. Well, if a child who's a beneficiary of the old trust is deemed to have made a gift to the new trust, the child is the transferor. That child's children are only one generation removed, so they are not skipped persons with respect to that child. So the portion of the new trust is deemed to have been having that as a transferor would have its own definition of skipped person being a grandchild, whereas the portion of the new trust that's deemed to have been transferred from the child that's the beneficiary, um, that portion, the grandchild would not be a skipped person with respect to the child. It would have to be a great-grandchild who's a skipped person. So we get a lot of complexity here with the GST transfer or idea. So it seems to me that running the, the, the gift or GST statute of limitations regarding a transfer between trusts may be dicey. Now, it may be you just give up on finality and use the formula based on the appraised value and say, well, the appraisal is conclusive absent any errors of fact or analysis. Now, the Nelson case decided last year respected a formula according to the appraisal, um, but the court determined that the value was actually different than what the appraised value was, and so there was a gift element. And now, now I don't, I don't recall anything from that case that mentioned that the appraiser would appraisal would be adjusted if there were any errors of facts or analysis. Um, so you could say maybe that the appraisal is conclusive absent any errors of facts or analysis to try to give you an in on saying that, well, if the IRS comes back and says, well, that was a different thing, then you say, well, I guess you're saying that we had an error of fact or an error of analysis. Uh, now, I don't know that a court would would respect that. Um, you know, a lot of people would be concerned about the Proctor case because the Proctor case is based on subsequent events, and, and the IRS audit is a subsequent event. So I don't know how much confidence I have in saying the appraiser, appraisal is conclusive absent any errors of factual analysis, um, but it would give me an argument, and maybe that argument can lead to a better result. Now, just, I guess, kind of a final note on on this idea of the sales between trusts um, in terms of, um, you know, do you just go ahead and do it and just do your best? So a gift in a state tax audit to ask about transfers made by the donor or by the decedent, um, but here we have a, a sale between trusts. So you might be able to honestly answer no, I didn't make a transfer as a donor. No, I as a student didn't make the transfer. It was the trustee who made the transfer. And and GST returns do not ask about um, about you know go through and say what you know how did you calculate your inclusion ratio? What were the transfers to the trust? They don't do any of that. They just say tell me what the inclusion ratio was, and has anything happened to change it since you last submitted this return a uh, return on this? So. Um, it, it seems that a sale between trusts, you, you can't get the finality, uh, or at least it would be very, very difficult to do so, um, but maybe just do a good faith sale and hope for the best. Uh, it's, it's, it's less likely to be audited, and if it is, here you got your proof. So uh, alternatively, maybe – consider distributing to the beneficiaries and then the beneficiaries do their own estate planning. And then their own estate planning would trigger the statute of limitations. Now, what, you know, what about the distribution of beneficiaries? Well, the, does the trust agreement authorize the, the distribution of beneficiaries? Is it just for ascertainable standards? Or is it for any reason whatsoever, like welfare or best interest or something like that? If it if it is the latter, then maybe it's fine. Just do the distribution. Um, but if if the 
distributions to beneficiaries are somehow limited, then there can be income tax or gift tax consequences for doing that distribution because you, you, know, you have basically the other beneficiaries who are consenting. Um, or maybe the other beneficiaries don't consent, but the trustee does the distribution, they don't object, and by their acquiescence, they're letting something happen that technically was not allowed to happen. So they, they could be deemed to make a gift for that. So you consider that, consider the trustee's exposure for making the distribution. You know, the money wasn't, the, the assets were in the trust. It was all protected for the remainder men. And now, boom, it's out of the trust. Beneficiary can do whatever they want with it. The remainder men are exposed. They may be left high and dry. So the trustee may have exposure, which I'm going to discuss that in a moment, uh, a way to, to, to deal with that. And then the other thing is that transaction. You know, if the trustee makes a distribution and then and then the beneficiary makes the gift, is that really just simply a transfer from the old trust to the new trust because they all happen together? And the more you lock it down to to protect the remainderman's interest, the more it'll look like a step transaction. So there's a trade-off between the trustee's exposure and a possible step transaction attack. Uh, okay, so I already mentioned the first bullet point here on slide 17. Um, you could distribute a um, the the trust to a, a an incomplete gift trust for the beneficiary. So the beneficiary sets up the trust. Um, retains all kinds of powers in it, but we have the non-adverse party being a co-trustee with the beneficiary. The beneficiary has a general power appointment. They're really deemed to own it for income tax purposes, for gift tax purposes, for estate tax purposes. They are the deemed owner. And the fact that you have a non-adverse party as, as, a, as a trustee who might govern what they do, well, a general power appointment is still a general power appointment, even though it requires the consent of a non-adverse party. So that, if you put it into a trust like that, maybe that would protect the um, help protect it, where that that non-adverse party will make sure the remainder of interests are protected. It still might look like a step transaction, possibly, but. Um, but let, but let's just kind of think about we'll think about that in a moment. Um, but in terms of what about the trustees making the distribution? They may be liable. Well, suppose the trustee distributes it to this incomplete gift trust or some other arrangement, and the trustee gives the trustee reserves the right to take it back, and the trustee discloses this transaction to the beneficiaries and says to the beneficiaries that, um, you know, you have whatever the period of time is. In Missouri, it's one year. Like in Florida, it's six months. Whatever it is, you have a certain amount of time to complain about the transaction, to bring a claim against me. If you don't bring a claim within that period of time, then I'm off the hook. And the Uniform Trust Code lets you do that. And, again, it varies from state to state and whether they've adopted the Uniform Trust Code. But what you can do is then, is then the trustee says, I retain the right to take back that distribution any time during that claim period. And then when the claim period is up, now the trustee can't get sued. So now the beneficiaries, they don't have to sign an affirmative release. They're simply not objecting. Now, the failure to object might be a gift. I don't know. Um, but it's a lot less clear that that's a gift than an affirmative release would be. All right, slide 18. Um, if the new trust is considered a continuation of old trust query, whether the transfer has changed. And if you look in, in, in that part that's referenced there, there are there, there is one example where there was a deemed gift by a beneficiary, but the arrangements of the trust, the structure of the trust didn't change. And, and the regulation the example says, the transfer didn't change either, even though there was a gift by a beneficiary. So that 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 was a surprise to me to see that. 
And I just wanted to point that out. But again, even if the transfer has not changed, a sale from the incomplete gift trust to a new trust, okay, the beneficiary is reporting that sale properly on the gift tax return. There's a release of the general power appointment. There's no doubt they made a transfer of some sort. That would run the gift tax statute limitations. So I think that that could be relatively safe. So that concludes my discussion on sales between trusts. Um, I certainly encourage you to put questions into the chat box. I, we'll see whether I have a chance to answer them or not. If I don't, then I'll, I'll still uh, be happy to, uh, to talk to you afterwards. All right, now we're moving on to writing off business interests. So we're going to talk about how to prove that a business interest is worthless. We'll talk about the income tax consequences of worthlessness, including whether it's a capital loss or an ordinary loss. And, and a lot of this is keying, the, the, the initial discussion is keying on a particular 2019 tax court case which summarizes the law in this area. Okay, um, so we'll go on to slide 20 here. So again, this is a quote from that case. So any quotation marks here are from that 2019 tax court case. So um, here's the, the, the deduction for a loss. It says the loss sustained during a tax year. So, so how do we know this allowable as a deduction? It has to be evidenced by closed and completed transactions fixed by identifiable events and actually sustained during the year. Now, we're going to talk about kind of an exception to that as well, but, but this is the, the overall standard. So on slide 21, worthlessness is a standalone justification for a deduction as a loss. In this case, involved a partnership interest. So they say the taxpayer may deduct a loss from an investment in a partnership if the partnership interest becomes worthless during the year. Uh, now, before I get on to the deduction for the worthlessness of the partnership interest, let me point out a dynamic that may save you from having to address this issue at all. And this dynamic is, is not, I, I don't think it's directly in these materials. So, um, so this you want to kind of take notes on. So what's going to make a partnership interest or maybe an S-corp interest worthless? Usually it's going to be ongoing losses. So, you know, the business got run into the ground, it lost money, and now that's why it's worthless. Well, the losses in a partnership or an S corporation, so again, I'm not really talking about a C corp here. Um, I'm talking about a partnership or an S corp. The losses that you sustain from business operations, those are ordinary business losses as a general rule. So the issue is, so what happens, so how do you deduct those losses? You deduct them against your basis. So if the business has been run to the ground and it's a pass-through entity, then your ordinary losses are going to run your, are going to maybe reduce your basis to zero, and then you don't have to worry about this issue at all, except if you have the passive loss rules coming in to disallow those losses, then you need to prove a disposition for passive loss purposes. Now, I'm not, in, in, in this article here, in this section of the paper, I don't go into what is a disposition under the passive loss rules. Uh, that is uh, basically my in my my big PDF. 
um, Roman numeral two, K uh, one has a bunch of subparts in it, and I have in there something devoted to what's a disposition under the passive loss rules. But but the concept of a disposition under the passive loss rules is, is not really necessarily much different, you know, any different than this concept under 165. So the learning that we have here uh, could uh, could also apply to some extent uh, when you have when you, when you're talking about deducting these losses. Um, but but that is I mean that is a nice benefit to the pass through entities is that you can just take your ordinary loss and not worry about proving uh, proving that uh, that the asset is worthless or that you disposed of it um, other than the passive loss rules. Okay. Um, in this particular case, they stipulated no abandonment of the partnership interest. We'll talk about what happens if they had had an abandonment. Slide 22. So what are the elements to prove worthlessness? So you have to demonstrate your subjective determination of worthlessness and prove that the asset in question is in fact essentially valueless. Now, essentially valueless doesn't mean absolutely positively without any value. So the taxpayer doesn't have this extremely high standard it does have a significant trans, uh, a significant burden of proof, and it, uh, it is pretty high still, but at least it's not ridiculously high. <clears throat> so what's subjective proof? So it, first of all, the taxpayer needs to take the position on the tax return that the business interest is worthless. I mean, that's Right there, that's an affirmative statement. That's the only way you're going to write off the loss anyway is if you try to write it off in your tax return. And in this case, that's what they did in the 2019 partnership case. Also, the owners and management testified credibly at the trial that they believed the asset became worthless during the year, and they pointed to objective facts regarding the business's struggles. So it's not just saying, ah, the economy looks like it's going bad. I think our business is going out of business. Um, I mean, that is one one factor, but you know, our our sources of business are drying up. Um, may, maybe maybe the the inputs into making our products are becoming too expensive. Um, who, you know, who knows? But but you you want to show there's some business realities going on there that. That 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 were that were made it reasonable for you to form this intent. Now, objective proof that in this that this 2019 case cited another case and 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 gave quotes from the other case. So here they talk about the the other case involves stock. So. So the value of stock or its worthlessness depends not only on its current liquidating value, but also what the, what value it might acquire in the future through foreseeable operations. So, you know, maybe you're having a horrible year because of COVID, but you expect to rebound after COVID is done. And uh, so, so maybe during COVID, it seems like it's not worth anything. But, but, because, but you, but you have an idea that because because COVID is, you know, hopefully we're going to get rid of COVID sometime. Uh, you know, they're talking about maybe this fall, who knows. Um, but, you know, when that happens and we can maybe rebound, uh, then the business can have value again. So you need to show that not only does it seem like you, if you liquidate, you get nothing, but also you don't, the business isn't going to be rebounding. All right, slide 25. Again, you need to have objective proof, and there should be some kind of identifiable event 
in the business of life that puts an end to your hope and expectation that it will be uh, that it'll make that'll make money and have value. So so you identify things. You know, it doesn't have to be one event, but it needs to be something that you can objectively point to. So let's go to slide 26. So here's a quote, and and uh, and there's you know, normally um, normally you need to kind of prove both things. Sometimes you can be so underwater that there's just no way you could ever recover. And so they have a quote here to talk about that. Slide 27. Um, again, for that prior case they were citing, um, then you have an issue about if you have uh, preferred in common. So when you have preferred equity, that means that, that, that those equity holders will get distributions before the other distribute before the other owners, the common owners, get anything. So it could be that the preferred the preferred equity is going to eat up all of the future profits. So we expect future profits, but we expect that the future profits will all go to the preferred because of the terms of the preferred, and that the common, the the, the subordinated equity. Uh, won't get anything, and, and so it is possible that the subordinate equity interest could become worthless. Um, so even though the company is the only concern, even though the company is not going to go away, the subordinate equity interest could be worthless because there's no way that the that they will ever get anything because the preferred will always get it. So that's another way to have worthlessness uh, of the subordinate. Okay, so back to the current case on slide 28. Um, so again, um, there's identifiable events, uh, and and maybe there's not potential value. So um, anyway, they basically took an analogy from the case they cited to that current case. Um, the IRS said, well, hey, you need to show that every asset is worthless, and and you really need to have the bank foreclosed, and the court said, non- nonsense. You need to have an expert appraisal? No. You need to just prove that, you know, they weren't going to make any money. <laughs> you don't need an appraiser to tell you the business isn't going to make any money. You, you just need to have, you know, proof of all the business factors. Um, so... Um, so in this particular case, the court said it would respect the family's efforts to keep the operating business going um, until it became hopeless, and the court the court respected that. Um, and and the, in this case, the family had new investments that put into a separate structure, and and so um, so that was when they kind of gave up on the business. They put their new new investments in a different structure because they knew that this business was gonna just, uh, you know, suck everything away. Okay, slide 30. Now now we've kind of gone through our worthlessness aspect. We've proven worthlessness. Um, is this an ordinary loss or is it a capital loss? Now, if you sell an asset at a, at a loss, then you've got a capital loss, and you can deduct it only against capital gain. Or for an individual, you can, you know, deduct three thousand dollars worth um, of ordinary income against it. Uh, but in any, but uh, the other, the other part about capital losses is you're offsetting capital gain, and long-term capital gain is taxed at favorable rates, and and so your your loss is. Has, has a lower tax benefit. You know, if you have a if you're in the 37% bracket for ordinary income and the 20% bracket for capital gains, then any losses you have that are deducted against ordinary income are going to save you 37%, whereas any losses against capital gains will only deduct save 20%. Um, so that's kind of kind of the general rule for having a capital loss. Um, there is something called the claim of right deduction. I'm not going to go 
spend time on that, you can just see the reference to the material. Slide 31, abandonment. I mentioned in that, in that 2019 case that, that they stipulated there was not abandonment. Well, abandonment is an alternative to proving worthlessness and it can generate an ordinary loss. So if you abandon your asset, then you've, you know, you're just kind of, it's gone. So, so in order to claim an ordinary loss for an abandonment, you have to have an intent to abandon the asset and an affirmative action of abandonment. So let's suppose you're a partner in a partnership and, and you want to abandon that and you say to the partners, you know, hey, I'm not going to work in the business anymore. You just go and do your own thing. You don't really need, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't expect anything from you. That will probably not be good enough. What you need to do is say, hey, I don't want to be a partner here anymore. I'm assigning back to the partnership my partnership interest. So I'm turning my back on it. I'm just, here it is. So, so, uh, so that would be an abandonment. Now, if you have a partnership that's subject to liabilities, so the way that partnership income tax works is that when a partnership assumes liabilities, those get allocated to the partners. When, when you as a partner get allocated liabilities, those add to your basis. They're deemed a contribution of cash by you. And if, if your share of liabilities goes down, you're being relieved of liabilities. That's like a distribution of cash to you. So if you abandon a partnership interest and there's liabilities in there, you are deemed to receive cash equal to those liabilities and you're treated as having sold your partnership interest for the liabilities. So that's a tough one on partnerships. Um, but again, maybe you just lost all this money, you got your ordinary income, you got your ordinary deductions for your losses because the business run to the ground and maybe you don't really you know, care about that. Okay, slide 32, there's a special um, provision, code section 1234, capital A, the taxes of capital gain or loss, um, certain certain things that occur and and so you're gonna if you have if you have one of these items then you have a capital loss instead of an ordinary loss and um and the and you see cancellation lapse ex ex expiration or other termination that doesn't the literal words don't say abandonment it, it's just a matter of it, it goes away on its own Um, the um, and then then the, the the last bullet point there the rights of code section twelve thirty one asset that's an asset that's used in a trade or business. It's a really weird aspect of our tax laws. Let's suppose you have a hundred million dollar building and, and and you're renting it out, so you're in the business of renting out the business. Um, yeah, of course, the rental income is not self employment income or anything like that. You know, it's passive income, but, uh, you know, generally. But um, but that business, that the building is being used in the business. So because the building is being used in the business, it is not a capital asset. Even though you have $100 million of capital in it, it is not a capital asset under our tax law. Really weird provision in our tax laws. So if you sell that, uh, that building, that's a, the, the capital gain is not because it's a capital asset, because it isn't. There's a special provision, Code Section 1231, that will that will give you capital gain treatment um, to the extent that there's not depreciation recapture, uh, which is a whole other issue, and I'm not going to go into the details about what depreciation counts and does what, et cetera. Okay. So anyway, um, 
a right to a 1231 asset does not qualify for that treatment as a capital gain, or it wouldn't also convert it to a capital loss either. Okay, there was a case on, on slide 33 called Pilgrim's Pride, and if the tax court, if the taxpayer had sold the stock, they, they would have gotten just a little bit of proceeds. Instead, it was more valuable for them to abandon it and get a $20 million ordinary loss. The, the, the tax benefit of the $20 million ordinary loss was greater than the proceeds that they would have gotten if they had sold it. So they simply abandoned it. And the tax court said it was a capital loss, but the Fifth Circuit said it's an ordinary loss. Um, and, and the Fifth Circuit seems to be right. So that was an interesting case. Herford versus Commissioner. Um, this was actually a Code Section 2036 case. And and the um, this, this uh, phantom stock was, was put into a partnership. And, and the partnership was held not to have a business purpose. When the taxpayer died, um, the partnership was disregarded for estate tax purposes. And therefore, all of the assets inside the partnership automatically got a basis step up without the need for 754 elections because it was deemed to have been owned directly by the decedent for purposes of estate taxes, which was good enough per for purposes of the Code Section 1014 basis step up. Um, and, and then, um, anyway, you can see this phantom stock turned into a capital asset, and 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 then um, they got extra capital gain on that. Okay, that's it on that topic. Let's go on to the partnership audit rules. I'm going to talk about how the partnership audit rules work. Electing out of the partnership audit rules and drafting for the partnership audit rules. Now, I did I did cover this a couple of years ago, um, but there have been um, a lot of proposed and then eventually final regulations issued. Um, when the statute first came out, there were a couple of a couple of people did um, a webinar and 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 complained about how unworkable it was. It got me greatly concerned. And, and yes, they did. Some of their concerns were legitimate, others were not. But all the legitimate concerns were addressed by regulations, um, which is, and, and it was good that they had ex expressed those concerns so they could get addressed. And certainly the American Bar Association's tax section had a lot of input into it. Um, and there was also some kind of behind the scenes lobbying as well. Um, from, from big accounting firms, I think. Okay, so these partnership audit rules, um, they have a framework on slide 37, um, and, and basically there's a lot of optionality here. The bottom line is, for these audit rules, the IRS is a little bit more in your face from the procedural aspect and just has more rights to protect its interests. But at the same time, taxpayers have more options on how to handle the audit. And, and I really think that the, the partnership audit rules, in most cases, are favorable to taxpayers in that they give you all these choices on how to handle the audit and those choices can give you a chance for, for a more practical resolution. So I still think these are pro-IRS, it's a pro-IRS statute, and it's overall prior IRS rules, but I, I, I do think there's, there's a lot of benefits for taxpayers here too. So if the tax impact is relatively small on the partnership audit, pay the, top, pay the, the partnership itself, pays the tax at the top rate, and by the way, when I talk about partnerships, that includes LLCs or taxes partnerships, as well as other law entities that are taxes partnerships. So um, if the tax impact is relatively small, the partnership itself pays the tax at the top rate, 
and then you don't have to worry about amending partner's returns or somehow having the investment show up on the partner's returns. The partnership pays a tax, boom, you're done. And if it's a small amount, why not just do that? It's just, it's to be simpler for everybody. And when we, when we talk about the electing out thing, um, then I will, I will mention that. Um, okay, so, so anyway, um, the, um, the other thing that you can do is you can um, push the adjustments out to the partners who were in the audited year to include on their current returns. So, so for example, let's suppose that the year um, 2018 is getting audited. Um, and, and, uh, and so the IRS says, okay, um, there's a $100,000 adjustment. Instead of the partnership paying that tax on the $100,000, um, the people who were partners in 2018 will include that $100,000 on their 2020 returns. Uh, now, they are going to have to pay interest at a higher interest rate, and they'll have to do a calculation on their return to go with it. Um, but they can do these calculations when they prepare their 2020 returns, and they don't have to go back and amend returns. So it, 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 it does cost some, mo some extra money to them to do that, um, but it's a lot simpler in many cases. So this is called a push-out. Another option on slide 38 is that the partners can amend their prior returns. So the people who were the partners in 2018, they can amend their returns, pick up those items, and, and to the extent that they report those adjusted items, they get taken off of the partnership's responsibility and now they're the partner's responsibility for 2018, in my example. So that way you can use the partner's own 2018 tax attributes, in my example, to blunt the severity of the audit effects. So, um, you know, that, that, can be, that can be beneficial. Uh, now, the thing is that the partnership has to go to the trouble of saying, okay, Partners, go amend your returns. Now, partners, I want a copy of re your return, and I want proof that you paid the IRS the tax that was due. The partners have to get that package together and submit it to the IRS and show to the IRS that all of these adjustments were implemented and the IRS got all its money. So it is a burden on the partnership. Um, but again, from a tax perspective, being able to use the partner's own tax attributes is a favorable thing. Now, what if you amend uh, the partnership's return, tax return? So the general rule is that the amended returns have to go through the process of an administrative adjustment request. And, again, show the IRS that all the partners amended their returns to reflect this amendment to the partnership return. So it's, you know, it's not as favorable as having the, um, you know, the partners do it on their own and not, and not showing it to the IRS because you don't know whether the partners actually did it or not. Um, but it's certainly fair to the IRS and the partnership just has to go through that effort. Now, there is one way around it if you catch the mistake early. If the partnership return is not yet due, then the, the changed return is not called an amended return. It's called a superseding return, and you don't have to go through that administrative adjustment request process. And... Um, and what you might consider doing, um, there's a pro and a con to this, the partnership could amend, I'm um, sorry, could extend its return. So you have the partnership return that's due in the spring, 
and you say, hey, um, I, I want, you know, we just put this together. We really haven't analyzed it. You know, we just got in under the wire. Um, you know, it's possible that it may be a mistake somewhere or some, or some fact that we find out about, about the prior year. Like if we're in the middle of doing 2020 returns in 2021, say the partial return due in the spring of 2021, you know, what, what if there's something that you missed from the 2020 year and you didn't realize it and it comes up later? Or what if you made a mistake on the partner's identifying information? So, uh, you know, then you would need to be changing your return. So if you, in the spring, do your extension on your return, um, then you don't have the return due until the fall. And um, and then during that whole, you know, summertime, you can make sure it's right. And if there's a mistake, you can amend the return, and you don't have to go through the administrative adjustment request. And and you'll you see uh, where I refer in that first bullet point to that 2G 20C Roman at one. Well, that that includes the idea of the superseding return, including a revenue procedure that discusses that idea. Okay, electing out of the partnership audit rules. Um, suppose you say, hey, I don't want to mess with these rules. Too much accountability to the IRS. I don't want to be accountable to the IRS. Um, so, first question is, are you eligible? Well, here's the list of eligible partners on, on, on slide 40. Um, individual, C corporation, S corporation. Um, so, those are some some examples. However, on slide 41, a trust is an ineligible partner. Even a revocable trust. So you have a revoke, you, you hold your partnership interest in your revocable trust. Under the grantor trust rules, you are directly treated as the owner. You don't file a trust income tax return. I mean, there's a way you can, but let's suppose you just, I'm giving my social security number to the partnership and they're reporting under my social security number, um, and it's going directly on my Form 1040, my individual return. That is an ineligible partner. Now, I think that position is totally ridiculous, but the IRS is entitled to take that position, and it did so in the regulation, so too bad. Same with the disregarded entity. You have a single member LLC, so you decide you know, here's a general partnership here. I don't want the liabilities. I'm going to interpose a single member LLC. That single member LLC is going to use my social security number, just like the revocable trust did. For income tax purpose, the thing does not exist. But for purposes of the partner of the partner audit rules, it does exist. And and so that's a disqualifying partner. And then also a partnership. If a partnership is a partner. Um, and, and the and, you know, like you might have a holding partnership, this is, an, this is a partner in the operating partnership, well, that holding partnership is an ineligible partner. And it doesn't matter what kind of partners it has itself. That partnership is an eligible partner. It disqualifies you from opting out. Now, suppose you do successfully opt out of the partnership rules. Um, then... What is the consequence? Then, what is the consequence there? Um, well, the audit is not necessarily coordinated among the partners, which you know I don't know. You might you know that it might be better to be coordinated among the partners. Um, but but the key thing is the partners must amend their own prior year returns. So I have seen a situation before these partnership audit rules even came into existence where the partner had to amend his return to show a relatively small loss. That taxpayer had losses from other business operations, which were much, 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 much greater than, than the amount of this, of this um, adjustment. So, so the adjustment actually, I'm sorry, the adjustment was a small amount of income to include. And, and they had these huge losses. Well, the IRS 
since it, since it was in there already, to make that small addition to the taxable income, it looked at the whole return. And this allowed a huge loss. So that was a very poor result for that taxpayer. And again, that's why it's kind of nicer to either have the partnership pay the tax if it's a small amount or push it out to the now current year return. And again, in my example of a 2018 tax return being out in 2020, push it out to the 2020 return. Nothing is going to open up the 2018 return, so it makes things simpler. Now, if you elect out, does that make an audit less likely? Um, well, you might think so. And certainly the whole purpose of the partnership audit rules is to make it more you know, e easier for the IRS to audit and, and more likely to audit because there was a finding by the um, Treasury Inspector General for Tax saying that the IRS was not auditing enough partnership returns, and that's what generated this, this whole thing. But the IRS also is responsible for reporting on you know, the whole efficacy of this stuff. And, 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 and I think that they are going to be, you know, auditing some people who opted out at the very least, just to see were they eligible to opt out. Um, so I don't know whether that makes an audit less likely or not. Um, I think that the, the jury is out on that. So uh, we need to see, you know, 2018 was the first year that this, that these new, new rules applied. And, 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 and of course, you know, they haven't had a whole lot of time to audit those returns. All right, how about drafting, drafting the partnership audit rules? So, again, I would rather be in the partnership audit rules to give me the options of amending the, of, of um, having the partnership pay the tax, amend my prior year return, or add the income to my new return, to my current year return. I'd rather have those three options. Um, so, I've, I'm not necessarily going to be wanting to elect out even if. If, even if I could. Uh, so drafting to the partnership audit rules. So the partnership representative has absolute authority to deal with the IRS. Um, and, and whatever the partnership representative says, that, that is absolutely binding on the partnership and, and the partners. Um, and the idea is that under the old rules, the IRS had to talk to several people potentially and get inconsistent views or people disavowing what was going on, no more. Absolute authority by the partnership representative, you know, they have the authority of a dictator in a banana republic. Um, and, and the partner's only recourse would be against the partnership representative. So um, I'm just going to sue you for what you did. Um, now, here's, I'm going to tell you my recommendation for dealing with these. And it's going to sound really weird, but this is one of those things that um, the statute wasn't really necessarily clear on, um, but the regulations, after a lot, of, a lot of input from taxpayers, they convinced the IRS to do this. And that is, you can make an entity be the partnership representative who has this authority. So you can make the partnership itself be the partnership representative. And that way, instead of having one person make all the decisions, the partnership agreement can control the decision-making process. And then the partnership names a designated individual. And that person has absolute authority to deal with the IRS, but they are required to follow the partnership's decisions. So it gives the partners a chance to have input on the audit process um, and because the designated individual is required to gather that input. Okay, now I have a sample form that requires partners to cooperate with a partnership representative. And, um, and you know, what should you, um, you know, what, what, what level of cooperation should you really do? So in the sample form, it says that partnership representative can require partners to amend their prior returns. Now, you may or may not want to do that. Again, the, the partnership may say, hey, let's push these items onto your prior return. Then we won't have to deal with anything more. It's going to be easier for us as a partnership. 
And the partner says, wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't want to open up my prior year return. It has too much exposure. I don't want to amend it. Um, if there's a partnership item that I should have put on my amended return, I'll just pay the tax. Have the partnership pay the tax, and I will reimburse the partnership. And I think having that optionality does make a lot of sense. Um, you certainly ought to give a partner, the partnership, the right to be reimbursed when, when, um, when a partner doesn't amend their return. Um, but, but in, in no event is the partnership ever going to be held, be left holding the bag, because the partnership can always elect to do a push out to the partners. And in my example, if you had the 2018 return being audited in 2020, the partnership can say, "Hey, partners, here's." 2018 partners, here you go. Here are the adjustments from the 2018 return. You have to report those on your 2020 return. The partners have no way to resist that, and doing that push out prevents the partnership from owing any tax. So, um, so the, the, again, the partnership really is in the driver's seat here, um, but there can be some back and forth with the partners to figure out what everybody wants, and you can do different things for different partners potentially. Um, so those are um, the drafting ideas. Um, I'm gonna do the conclusion here and, and, and do a concluding remark and then I'm gonna go back and answer some questions. So, so first of all, on slide 46, um, I've been uh, doing webinars for a, an organization called CPA Academy since last May, and uh, and there are three webinars, and those webinars grant CPE credit um, uh, and other continuation credit. In terms of CLE, Thompson Coburn will provide CLE just like it is for this one. It'll provide CLE for Missouri, Illinois, and California. So if you go to my CPA Academy webinar page, uh, you 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 can see three offerings there. For those who are doing fiduciary income taxes, you can see I have um, a, a few different topics there. Um, I also have, uh, on February 18th, if you look down further further on, there's a TCLE on February 18th, the fiduciary income tax refresher. That's an hour and a half long. Um, the CPA Academy one, it just goes into more in depth. I, have, I do have a fiduciary income tax refresher. There's two hours for that as well as a separate one on how to shift income to beneficiaries, as well as a separate, you know, those other separate ones. Um, I also do these reports on heckling, which of course usually come out in January, but heckling was postponed till May. Um, and um, they had hoped to have it in person in May, but uh, I think the chances of that are probably slim and none. So we'll have to see how they, how they uh, react to it. Um, so those are resources that the very last bullet point is other Thompson Coburn resources and so we have some free resources that are available um, in, in other practice areas and so I, I suggest that you click on that and just look to see what other practice areas you might be interested in. Um, so um, again I'm going to say a concluding remark but I'm going to go back and ask and answer a question or two. So thank you for participating in our webinar. Um, when, when the webinar concludes, please complete and submit the survey that we'll display so we can get our evaluations, um, which of course we need because I want to know how well I did in your opinion, as well as uh, just for our crediting, uh, crediting purposes. Okay, so I had a question here. Please clarify if the partnership amends Form 265 from a prior year, do, does the part, do the partners need to amend? Um, so if it's a voluntary amendment, and then you have this administrative adjustment request strategy. Um, and, and, um, I, and I guess the question is, can you maybe have the partnership pay the tax or do a push out? And um, my initial recollection is that I think you could do, you have your choice of what you have, of what you can do just like you can in the event of an audit. 
But I'm not 100% solid on that. I'd have to go back and look it up to be sure. Okay, I had another question. When the sales price is based on an appraisal, if, if there is any excess value due to or from either side of the sale transaction, um, if the parties displaying the benefit, don't you have finality the sale price based on the appraisal? Um, well, if the, the – there the, uh, a disclaimer is – I think that the question is, can you use a disclaimer instead of a formula clause? Um, so you do your appraisal, and then the – and then, and, then, and then the – like the buyer might say, if there's anything in excess that would make it a gift – make it a gift instead of a sale, I hereby disclaim. And – and I do recommend drafting into trust um, that a beneficiary may disclaim on behalf of the trust and cause the excess to go back to the grantor. Uh, that, that's something you can draft into the trust and you can use that disclaimer. Um, now, if it's a sale between trusts, though, again, if you're disclaiming it, then you know, what are you disclaiming? The value is finally determined I'm not quite sure what it is you're disclaiming. So it, it would be the finality aspect. We still don't, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you determine what is being disclaimed? The, the value is finally determined for gift tax purposes if you don't know what the gift tax is. So I think it really is still a tough issue. Um, the formula transfers for estate planning course um, goes into uh, more details on formula transfers. Uh, it, it had the first half hour goes into the what are irrevocable grantor trusts, and then the last hour goes into the formula clauses. And, and people who listen to that have really enjoyed it and felt found that beneficial. So, so that's it. Please submit your surveys. I look forward to future contact uh, with all of you. Thank you very much for attending.